Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for dialing in. For those that I haven't met, my name's Andrew Lally. I'm head of uh, Partners Private, which is part of uh, Partners Wealth Group. Uh, really excited today um, to be uh, talking about the Dexas Real Estate Partnership Fund. I just wanted to introduce on the panel with me, I've got Graham Bibby, Chief Investment Officer of Partners Wealth Group. Jason Howe, who's the lead portfolio manager for the Dexas Real Estate Partnership Fund, and Brad McCann, who's the assistant portfolio manager. Um, we've been thinking long and hard about how to, um, how to position portfolios at, at this part of the cycle. And um, we're really excited and, and think the uh, Dexas Real Estate Partnership Fund is, is the right strategy for this part of the cycle. We're just, uh, in terms of the format for today, we're just gonna go through a bit of a presentation, a bit of a recap on, on uh, Partners Private and what we do. Um, the guys from Dexas are gonna run through the fund and then we're gonna have Q&A at the end. Um, and please, if you've got any questions, there's functionality to lodge those questions and we'll deal with them at the end. So just uh, a bit of a recap on, on Partners Private, um, just after the noting the disclaimer. Uh, Partners Private Wealth Group has been providing advice to high net worth individuals for more than 18 years. And uh, for too long, uh, private wealth portfolios in Australia have been heavily reliant on returns from listed equity markets. We firmly believe that our clients should have the same access to private and alternative assets as sovereign wealth funds and the large industry funds. In terms of really what we're trying to do, Partners Private offers wholesale clients the opportunity to directly invest in high quality alternative assets, spanning property, private equity debt, and other alternative asset types. It's really our extensive networks and relationships that we're able to source and screen these opportunities. And we're able to provide this um, through, uh, through our networks. Really providing access is, is core uh, to what we do for our clients. It's just important to note that um, on this opportunity, we're also partnering with the Silk Group um, and they're a alternative asset solutions provider. Just in terms of uh, the next slide, um, Partners Private has, has come a long way in a very short period of time. Uh, we're investing 10 to 40 million in each asset, um, which, is, which is meaningful and it really does uh, put us in the context of, of sitting alongside some of those large uh, institutional investors. We have the resources. If you look at uh, an individual deal, there'll typically be 21 people looking at that deal um, from the investment committee, investment team, finance and legal. Due diligence often takes uh, at least eight weeks before we get investment committee sign off. I think importantly, the awareness of partners private um, has grown, particularly amongst fund managers, brokers, banks, and other intermediaries. And we're partnering with uh, best of breed specialists in, in each sector, and Dexas is certainly one of those. Our scale leads to earlier looks at opportunities, negotiated terms, and preferential allocation. And we're often able to break uh, investments down to 100,000 which is, is important uh, for investors to get the diversity. A bit about the history. So we have already 21 investments uh, that we've invested in and 177 million. And we've offered um, clients a diverse range of assets. And you can see from the chart on the right or the pie chart, um, that's really across private equity, uh, property debt, um, uh, property and um, corporate debt. The, the funds range from high yield income funds through to high growth private equity. And it, again, it just allows our clients to build a diversified portfolio, but also tailor it uh, to their individual needs. The investment style is, is very much focused on capital preservation. If you look at the assets um, across the 21, all are performing as expected, and the average IRR is 14% is with, with no problems or, or write-downs. Importantly, 
um, why Dexas and, and uh, in this market, why do we think it's a good investment? I think the volatility has well and truly uh, returned. Many assets are down 50 plus percent. Um, we suspect there's more economic pain on the way and particularly impacting corporate profits. Rising interest rates and, and tightening liquidity is making it harder uh, for businesses to raise capital. The IPO market is effectively shut and, and banks are really scaling back and de-risking. It's the perfect environment for private capital. For those investors able to think beyond the short-term noise, we certainly think the next 18 months is going to offer some of the best opportunities in, in the next, uh, best opportunities for the last couple of decades. Um, and it's in that context that, that we wanted to really talk about, about the DEXIS fund. I just wanted to, to then move across to Graham, uh, just to share a bit, bit of his perspective on the fund. Hello everyone, Graham Bibby, Chief Investment Officer. So my perspective is one of um, you know, looking across all asset classes for our advisors and clients and looking at public markets, as Andrew has said, we've got quite a volatile environment, equities down and quite a lot of volatility in, in bond markets, rising interest rates and inflation. So you know, we look to pr uh, look at public markets and private markets. And looking at private markets, we see this period of disruption is actually one of opportunity. So that's why we've particularly researched a, a range of strategies. And in particular, we think you know, the, the timing is right for opportunistic property, which is um, the Dexas Real Estate Partnership Fund. So I'd like to hand over to Jason House to uh, start off the presentation. Thanks, Graeme, and, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Today we're speaking about Dexas's Real Estate Opportunities Fund which is investing in scenarios ranging from distress through to growth and right throughout the capital structure, targeting repositioning, development and emerging pockets of dislocation. What we'll do today is we'll take you through a half a dozen slides that will show you the, uh, the, the key attributes of the fund and look forward to your questions after those slides. So to the first slide. This slide identifies the headlines that we think will be important to you as you consider an investment in the fund. The first question we think that you might ask is, who's the manager? Well, the manager is Dexas. Dexas is an ASX top 50 organisation with Australian real estate assets under management exceeding $44 billion across all of the major sectors. Dexas has 650 staff spanning a fully integrated real estate platform from planning through development through leasing, through asset management, through transactions, an end-to-end -end platform. And it's that platform that we're leveraging to identify and manage investments, as we'll discuss in a moment. So the manager is, uh, the manager is first rate. The next question you might answer, that you might ask rather, is, is there a relevant track record? And the answer is yes. Dexas is unique among Australian REITs in it has a very direct and specific trading track record. Since 2012, Dexas has pursued a buy to sell, develop to sell trading strategy on balance sheet, which across 21 exits has delivered an IRR of 30%. Okay, that's a directly relevant track record and activity that, what, that we're picking up, broadening and packaging into this fund. So if you, can, if you can satisfy yourself with the manager and with that track record, then the next question you might ask is, how is the investor aligned with the manager? And we have two levels of alignment, which I think are, are really important. The first, and if I can take your attention to the fourth bullet point on the right hand side, is that Dexas has invested $100 million into the fund. In a fund that has a size, a target size of 300 and a cap of $500 million, 100 million is a substantial investment. The second level of alignment is that we've provided for Dexas to invest alongside the fund. So in addition to investing in the fund, we can invest alongside the fund. And so of our first four investments, two of them are actually 50-50 investments alongside the Dexas balance sheet. So you've got, you've got two layers um, giving tremendous alignment with the manager. Having satisfied yourselves on those three points, then perhaps you step to, uh, to return and to, to strategy. Uh, the return that we're targeting, as mentioned on screen here, is 15% uh, IRR, net of fees. And strategy is an excellent segue to the next slide. 
If I can take your attention to the left hand side of the slide first of all, where we step through the objective of the fund, the investment strategy and the fund positioning. The objective I touched on when um, in the introduction, and that is to, um, to deliver enhanced returns by investing throughout the capital structure in situations ranging from distress through to growth. But it's the strategy and the positioning that I really want to talk about because it's one thing to have a, an objective, it's another thing to be able to deliver on it. The investment strategy is to leverage the Dexus real estate platform to both identify and manage investments. We'll come back to that in a moment. The way that we position this fund to, to compete for opportunities in the marketplace is based on the provision of both capital and capability. Okay, so we're very deliberately targeting opportunities where what we can bring to the table is not just capital, not just a check, but also the DEXIS capability, that integrated platform that I mentioned a few moments ago. So when we're, when we're doing a deal, what we're, try, what we're trying to do is differentiate ourselves in the market, remove ourselves from what might otherwise be a competitive position to deliver both capital, but also DEXIS know-how. And what that allows us to do, and this is super critical, critical goes to business model. What it allows us to do is to create value on the buy, create value on the way in, but also create value in the asset, which we think will be critical in this cycle. So that positioning is super important and it's playing out. In, if, uh, for those of you who, uh, who like data, the reality is that the first four deals that we've done have all been off-market deals. Okay, They've all been proprietary deals and, and we'll, Brad will talk to you in a few moments um, around how our capability is being brought to bear. Over on the right hand side of the slide, uh, we step through the four functional strategies um, in terms of how we'll deploy um, capital. The first is development, that's develop to sell. Okay, we've clear examples of develop to sell in the track record that we'll step through. The second is repositioning to sell. So buying something, rezoning it, converting it to a higher and better use, selling it. The third is special situations. This could be purchase of, um, of a non-performing loan, or it could be purchase of an asset out of receivership, an opportunity that, uh, that we're seeing right now. And the final strategy on the slide there is credit strategies. And this is really about, um, is about providing capital again, where we see a risk adjusted return that, um, that, that justifies um, participation in the deal. So right throughout the capital structure, which maximizes the addressable market for us. We note here the, um, the typical investment horizon for each of these um, transactions is, uh, is less than five years. The next slide here talks through our target portfolio composition. And the way you should think of this is as the guidelines that the fund needs to adhere to in investing your capital. And so while we'll leave you to read the detail in your own time, what this slide does is shows you um, the geographic constraints that we have. So the focus will be on capital cities and will be on Sydney and Melbourne, as you can see at the top. There's sector constraints to ensure that we're focused on the, the, um, the traditional sectors in the Australian real estate market, including where Dexas has that expertise. Similarly, the strategy constraints to make sure that we don't end up as a credit only fund or a development only fund, there are caps on amount of capital that we can deploy into those strategies. Concentration risk, as you would expect, is, uh, is managed. And at the bottom, we, uh, we refer to the target gearing range for the fund. And I'll note there that the target gearing range is a look through. So it's an aggregation of any fund level debt and any asset level debt. Now, stepping through um, the track record a little, we, uh, we gave you a, a headline um, at the start of this presentation. As I mentioned, since FY, 12, Dexas has had 21 exits in this buy to sell strategy um, and realised almost half a billion dollars of profits at an average property level IRR of 30%. In that track record, there are examples of development to sell, of rezoning to sell, of refurbishment to sell, and of buying well and creating value in the asset. And each of those transactions has been reviewed by the PWG team. What we're showing you here is, I guess, just a snapshot of some of those deals. So to draw your attention to the bottom right, uh, which is the Flinders Street car park. The higher and better use strategy here was buy, rezone to residential and sell. Okay, rezoning from car park to residential fundamentally created value. Moving to the top left-hand corner, Elizabeth Street in, um, in Sydney. 
the strategy here again was higher and better use. And in this instance, it was rezoned from a B grade office to hotel and residential and then sold. So the value is being created through Dexus's ability to rezone and, um, and to target a higher value use. Now stepping on to the actual portfolio, I'll pass over to, uh, to Brad to, to work, walk through the deals that we've done to date and the structure of the fund. Thanks Jason. Um, referring to the left hand side of the slide, you will see that there is currently $276 million of committed capi capital within the fund. Off this 146 million or 53% has been allocated to the first four investments in the fund. You'll notice that only 9% of this committed capital has been drawn from, from investors. This is important for new investors coming into the fund because an equalization premium is required for subsequent closings. And this is calculated at 10% of drawn equity, not allocated equity, reducing the equalization premium for new investors. The fund also has a cap call facility at the fund level and it has uh, a debt headroom of 52 million. And this is generally utilised for the operational activities of the fund and perhaps for some smaller investments or credit deals should, that, should they be required. I'll, um, at the top of the slide, you will see three charts. These charts depict the diversif diversification of the fund as it currently sits. You will see that we are currently overweight industrial in the first slide. We are comfortable with this at the moment due to the strong underlying fundamentals of this sector. We are also well spread across repositioning, credit and development deals and all our acquisitions to date have been in Sydney and Melbourne. I will now talk you through uh, the first four investments in the fund in a bit more detail on the following slide. So the first um, investment listed here is in Elstonwick, which is in a suburb that the people from Melbourne will be familiar with. It is uh, known as a blue chip suburb, about eight kilometres southeast of the CBD, close to shopping precincts and the beaches. And this particular site is on Glen Huntley Road and it is close to the Elstonwick train station, bus stops, and the tram line as well. We are in a syndicated construction finance facility with a third party on a 50-50 basis on this development. Um, the development has approval to deliver a 12-storey building with 99 residential apartments with some office suites and some retail on the lower levels. We are comfortable with this, with this acquisition due to our um, senior position within the capital stack. We have a first mortgage right over the land and some of the property off the borrower. The deal was achieved at an LTV of 61% including capitalised interest. This provides an adequate buffer should residential values fall. It also allows us to enter the residential sector without taking an equity or asset management position. The second deal listed here is in Brighton Street in Richmond. This is a boutique office development that we are looking to do um, in Brighton Street, about 30 metres south of Swan Street. You will be familiar with the area and this uh, vicinity is, is, is great for mixed use commercial development and we will be looking to develop a 9,000 square metre boutique office development uh, in this vicinity. We paid a 5% deposit that is refundable last year and settlement is conditional on the vendor receiving planning permit. We're working with the vendor to receive this planning approval and we anticipate to have that by the end of the year and com commence construction in the first quarter of 2023. We, we entered this deal so we could leverage Dexas's capability in development and asset management. We also have strong conviction in the Richmond and Cremorne area for office boutiques due to, and we identified, we actually identified a delivery supply gap in 2024 when this asset is set to reach practical completion. Chester Hill is a small unit industrial development that we have gone into with Dexas balance sheet on a 50-50 basis. It is, in the, it is in the Sydney's inner west, about 25 kilometres west of the CBD and has great locational attributes, such as being 400 metres from the Chester Hill train station, close to Sydney population centres, and a five minute drive to key arterials. 
lending itself to last mile e-commerce type tenants. We will look to develop a 23,000 square metre uh, development here and we are very confident in the underwrite of this asset. We are confident because Dexas has great market knowledge of this area. Dexas recently committed or completed a 57,000 square metre industrial development in the suburb of South Granville, which is a five minute drive from Chester Hill. This asset was delivered 100% let at PC on record rents for the area. It also won the 2021 Industrial Development of the Year at the Development Excellent Awards. The fourth um, investment here is our most recent. We entered this transaction in June of this year with Dexas Balance Sheet as well. The opportunity is a land rezoning from farmland to industrial, and it is in the tightly held um, precinct of West Melbourne in Ravenhall. Once this uh, asset is rezoned, we'll have significant valuation uplift and will be highly sought after by buyers looking to unlock its development potential. The intention at the moment is to sell the asset on rezoning. However, should superior, superior returns be available to investors, if we were to develop it, we will look at that opportunity as well. We are very comfortable with the rezoning going through due to Dexas building a 100 hectare industrial development site opposite this block of land. They know the council very well, and that industrial site is 70% committed with high caliber tenants such as Amazon and Nike, at record rents as well. You'll also see on the far right hand side of this slide that our targeted returns are above the target net equity IRR of 15% and in some of the cases, significantly above this 15%. Thank you for your time. Uh, thanks, Jason and, and Brad um, for that. I think we're just gonna move into questions now. And, and Graeme, did you wanna facilitate the, the questions? Yes, I'll, I'll start off. So um, Jason, what type of investor are you targeting for the fund? We mentioned at the start of this call that um, the Dexas has a large um, asset base under management, uh, $44 billion. $26 billion of that is, is actually in funds um, as opposed to balance sheets, uh, exactly what we're talking about here. And the history of that business is almost entirely uh, institutional investors. Um, and so with that institutional background, um, the, you know, the, the majority of investors in the fund today and the majority of investors that we expect to be in, th in the fund by final close will be institutional investors. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, the reason that we're here today is that um, you know, from, from our perspective, it, uh, it offers us the opportunity to broaden our capital base. And obviously from your perspective, it offers you the opportunity to, to give your clients access to what is otherwise you know, an institutional fund manager. That's right, and I think as Andy's mentioned, um, you know, we are at, sit alongside uh, other institutional investors as a conduit into, uh, into the fund. Um, so on the um, trading strategy, the DEXIS balance sheet strategy, if that continues to exist, how does the fund compete for deals with the balance sheet? Yeah, look, this is a good question and, and it goes to conflict and uh, you, you, should, you should know that, um, that DEXIS with that history of funds management is um, has very strong governance practices and deals with um, conflict situations um, in advance. So what we've done here is the General Management Committee um, at Dexas has passed a resolution saying that if, an, an, if a, a, an opportunity comes to the table that both the trading strategy on balance sheet would like to pursue and the fund would like to pursue, then that opportunity must at least be shared. And so we can't end up in a situation where the balance sheet could cherry pick the good deals mm -hmm. and, and put the secondary deals to the fund. That just can't happen. And so consequently, you already see that two of the first four deals are 50-50 investments with that balance sheet. Yeah. And look, the, the reality of that coexistence as well is that um, is that this first fund size is deliberately small at mm -hmm. 300 to 500 million dollars and so that can't replace entirely the balance sheets mm -hmm. trading strategy so the the idea to to coexist mm -hmm. um, uh, makes complete sense that's great um, so as an investor you know what time will um, my funds uh, be called and overall um, in the fund 
Yeah, this, uh, this is a question that we get um, asked often. Uh, so the fund has a seven year life. Um, and so the, the way that people often ask this question is, will my money be locked up for the life of the fund? And the answer is no, because being a closed end fund, what we have is, first of all, we have a very defined investment period. So um, funds must be invested within two years from November. Um, but the way that a closed end fund works, particularly with this buy to sell, develop um, to sell type trading strategy, is that when we sell an asset, all of the proceeds from that sale, both the principal invested and the gain from that sale, are returned to investors. Okay, so if you recall, we said that the average um, hold period for an asset was between one and five years. So each time we sell an asset, the proceeds, whether it's year three, year four from that sale, will be returned to investors. So yes, there's a seven year fund life, mm -hmm. but if you think about your distribution of cash flow, as we call it, um, the cash comes up and then it's distributed. So it looks like a bell curve. Okay, great. Um, so how does the uh, changing economic environment impact the fund? Okay, we've got lots of questions here, Graham. Yeah. <laughs> Look, the changing economic impact for the fund, uh, the impact on the fund is an opportunity. Mm -hmm. And so often people will come at us with, um, with fears around construction costs or mm -hmm. fears around the cost of debt. Um, but all of these pressures um, are creating the environment for our investment, okay? Mm -hmm. you, they create the opportunity for our investment. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you, if you think of, um, of a transaction where it may have been feasible six months ago, but it's no longer feasible today because of increased costs, be it debt, be it construction, mm -hmm. the owner of that piece of land will have to trade. They'll either sell that land or they'll refinance their, um, their land loan at an egregious rate. We can do both of those trades. Mm -hmm. And so the reality is that, that you know, we, as the market faces challenging times, we're presented with better and better acquisition opportunities, mm -hmm. which is why we're an opportunities fund. Yeah, and I think the starting point now is, is very good. And um, yeah, the changing economic environment will pivot the strategy as, as things evolve. We've got lots of more questions coming through. Please do uh, keep adding them into the chat and we'll address them as we go. Um, keep on going with the next one. Uh, what, is the, the, what do you see are the main risks in the fund and uh, how will they be mitigated? Sure. So we have, I guess we have macro risks to deal with and we also have um, asset level um, risks to deal with. In terms of the macro risks, um, let's just talk interest rates for a moment. Um, there's a range of economic forecasts out there from, you know, from 2.6 to 3.6 as a cap in interest rates and, um, and, and then perhaps a reversal in that trend. And so that's that, that macro environment is what we're looking to. So we're, we're looking at that and saying to ourselves, in this increasing cost environment, mm -hmm. that's when we want to be buying, mm -hmm. okay? And then post that cycle, that's when we want to be selling. And so when we think about, when we think about risks, again, it's, it's like a bond lens, it's in reverse, okay? So the risks that um, the market are assessing, we're seeing that risk as an opportunity. And so that's how we think about it from a macro perspective. In this increasing cost environment with increasing macro risks, we wanna be buying into that and selling post risk. Mm -hmm. At an asset level, um, the, the risks are right now are around, and we face them as well, are around permitting, are around construction cost, are around um, leasing. Um, and that's why we're focusing op on opportunities where the DEXUS um, platform can be brought to bear because as Brad mentioned when he, when he went through those at least the assets three and four, they're, they're repeat plays of things that DEXUS has done before. Okay? The, quality, the quality of the underwrite that DEXUS can bring to the table by taking out a development person, a leasing person, an asset management person uh, on all of the site inspections and then providing all the inputs into the, uh, into the underwrite um, allows us to just better manage those risks. Still lots of questions coming in, so um, yeah, I'll uh, be guided by um, you know, when we uh, will, um, you know, which ones we'll address, but let's try this one. Um, the fund seems relatively small compared to the size of transactions. This is a question coming in by, uh, raised by potential investor. So does this raise issues 
on diversification and um, you know, has it been structured in a way to keep the, you know, keep the fund size so small relative sure. to the investments. So two questions there. I, I guess if you look at, um, at the four deals that we've done so far, um, which account for approximately $150 million of equity, um, if you extrapolate that out, then if we, have a, um, if we have a $500 million fund, then we should expect yeah, well over 10 deals in, in the fund, perhaps 12, perhaps more. And, um, and so from a diversification perspective, the trend that we're seeing at the moment, I think would, uh, would satisfy the concern. I think the other way to satisfy that concern around diversification is you'll remember that um, the slide that we showed with the constraints, one of those constraints was on ticket size. And so it's not possible for us to do a deal which is greater than 25% of the fund or two deals that are greater than 20% of the fund. And so you know, I think structurally we've, um, we've addressed that diversification risk, but also from a uh, market traction perspective, as you can see, the data points indicate that we will deliver on diversification. Mm. Um, and the second part of that question was why so small? I, I, I think the, the reality of the answer to that question is that Dexus anticipates a series of opportunities funds, and this is the first in that series. And, and to be brutally honest, um, at this size, the, the expectation is that we hit the ball out of the park so that we can have a big second fund. So that's transparent. That's good. Um, question still being written here. I think I can get it. How much debt is um, going to be in the fund? What's the strategy for the debt? Um, and um, I'm not sure about the second part uh, to that. You can read it, Jason. <laughs> yeah, in terms of uh, debt, uh, again, we mentioned on the slide that, um, that we can, we're targeting between 45 and 55% of AUM in debt. And that's on a look-through basis. So any debt that we have at the fund level mm -hmm. and the asset level will be aggregated mm -hmm. when, we're, when we're assessing compliance with that target mm -hmm. of 45 to 75, of uh, mm -hmm. 45 to 55. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the second part of that question, which was income, Yes, look, if we generate income from rent or interest, then that will be distributed quarterly. Yeah. When we exit, a, exit a, um, an asset, then that will be distributed. The proceeds from that exit will be distributed following exit. Yeah, yeah. and just to add to that, I mean, this is an opportunistic strategy. So it's, it's not designed to be focused on income and steady income. It will have an income component, and that's an important part of it but it's looking to you know, aggregate total returns. Yeah, that's a, that yeah. entirely right. It's an absolute yeah. return fund. Yeah, that's right. Um, as such, um, you know, the returns, um, given that mix of income and capital gains, you know, how much will be, you know, might be taxed as income versus capital gains? Uh, that's, that's a great question mm. um, and goes to the structure of the vehicle that we have. So mm. investors would actually um, would buy a stapled security and that stapled mm. security would consist of a unit in a passive trust and a unit in an active trust. Mm. The passive trust will be used to take passive investments such as credit mm. plays. Mm. Um, and so that that will so the income from those players will be able to flow through. The active trust will take um, the develop to sell, reposition to sell type um, plays. Mm. That trust is anticipated to be taxed like a company with franking credits passed through with distributions. Mm. Maybe a question near wrapping up is uh, why partner with uh, Partners Private and what's the advantage uh, for Dexas and um, in us creating a feeder fund? Um, yeah, so I guess as I mentioned earlier, um, the the history of Dexas's uh, funds management business has been very much institutionally focused, mm -hmm. and so this opportunity for us gives us the uh, the chance to broaden our capital base, mm -hmm. and um, and that's uh, that's a clear part of our strategy. So so we we uh, we're very much interested in this. Yeah, and the second part of it really, and uh, Andy can address more and has, which is um, you know we're creating opportunities for. Uh, investors who can't allocate 10 million to a fund to be able to access uh, wholesale investments uh, that would otherwise be institutional only. Perhaps just one last one from me, Jason. Um, in terms of the pipeline and what you're seeing at the moment, and well, no uh, guarantees, just the likelihood of time frame to deploy the, the funds? Sure, it's a, it's a good question. So under the documents, as I mentioned, we have two years from November to, to deploy. But if I answer the question specifically, right now we have 13 deals in our pipeline and they cover each of the four strategies that I mentioned. Um, and two of those 13 deals we've got agreed terms on. And so we're, you know, we're in progressed diligence uh, with a you know, good line of sight to, to getting those deals done. 
if I had to, if I had to, if I was forced to guess, which you're forcing me to do, I would say that we will be fully invested in half of the time frame that we're permitted under the documents. The, the reality is that deal flow has fundamentally changed since the first half of this year. Okay, the deal flow is better um, and, it's, and it's greater. Um, and that's a function of the market change that's occurred, the repricing that's occurring, and so our ability now to deploy more actively is real. That's really helpful. Thank you guys, that's it's, it's been really interesting and, and we're certainly excited by this opportunity. We, we do think it's the right strategy for, for this part of the cycle. Just in terms of next steps, uh, so we are in the process of, of setting up the feeder fund and, and we're partnering, as I mentioned previously, with the Silk Group uh, and it'll allow our investors really to, to get access to the opportunity. I think if you're already registered in our, our database, you'll receive an email in, in the next couple of days and we're really targeting having a, an IM and, and term sheet finalised next week. I think if, if there's... Um, in terms of, of timetable, um, we're really uh, targeting firm expressions of interest by the end of September, September 30, and then funding around uh, mid-October, and that'll just be partly drawn on, on day one. If you're interested in, in participating, uh, please um, reach out to either your advisor or also uh, Michael Dockery at Partners Private. I think his details are, are there on the slides. So thanks again for, for dialing in and we look forward to uh, chatting further. Thank you.